You're listening to audio recorded at Mount Air First Christian Church. For more resources or to contact us, look us up at www.mountairfirstchristianchurch.org. Be the text we're going to be looking at, though we're taking a little break, like I've said, from our series through the book of Colossians. We'll get back into that, believe it or not. In the start of 2021, uh, I got to looking at my calendar. I wanted when we passed this, the elders, the elders spent over a year uh, going through our new doctrinal statement, kind of working through it in our, uh, after, after church once a month meeting, we went through this and kind of talked over it. And I had decided when we passed this, I wanted to do a series through the doctrinal statement. Well, I got to looking at my calendar and Advent comes the last Sunday of November. And so in order for us to get through this, I needed to start it like now. <laughs> so, so here we are uh, going to launch into a series I'm calling um, What We Believe, uh, The Truths of the Faith. And you'll see that statement in verse uh, 6 of, of 1 Timothy 4, being trained in the words of the faith. Um, but the, some translations call that the truths of the faith. And so this just kind of gets a little bit... Um, of the, the heartbeat behind the desire to know what we believe and, and why we believe it. And so Timothy is getting this letter from the Apostle Paul. We'll read the, the whole chapter here. It's a great chapter. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 Timothy, 16, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Now the Spirit expressly says, that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you, Paul now talking to Timothy, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by the prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God stands forever. Does anyone here enjoy um, nature documentaries? I I like nature documentaries. You ever catch a show on TV and you watch nature documentaries? I, I think they're... I, um, we have Disney Plus, and Disney has a whole section uh, on their streaming services of all sorts of animal shows. And we've watched quite a few of them, one on monkeys and one on, I don't know, all kinds of different stuff. But we watched one on penguins, and, and, and it's kind of funny the way they do it. They follow this one penguin, and they give him a name, and they follow him all around. But... Um, Eventually, you know, they're just, they're, they're amazing creatures. They think of the harsh environment they live on. But in every nature show, there's always the point where the predator shows up. 
right? It doesn't matter if it's, if it's gazelles in the African whatever plains or if it's penguins in, in the freezing cold. Something, some sort of a predator shows up. And in this documentary, leopard seals show up. And you just take a few, if you want to see something astonishing, Google leopard seals and penguins and look at some of the images of what happens when a leopard seal finds a penguin. It is ferocious. And so there's always, they get you all caught up emotionally with this penguin. And then all of a sudden they're crossing the ice and we see these leopard seals come out and we find a penguin just mercilessly ripped to shreds by a leopard seal. And you know what you never see? I mean, it's, it's, it's astonishing. Every time you see it, you're like, wow, that is, that is graphic. And you never, when you see this, they never cut a, a shot to the leopard seal where the leopard seal stops and thinks, boy, that was really kind of violent. That was, maybe that was a bit much. You know, you never see a leopard seal stop and think, could I do this a little more ethically maybe? You know, not quite so, just graphically. You, you never see them stop to reflect, is this really the best way to go about this? They don't think, they're never surprised at their own gruesomeness. Like, wow, that was really terrible. That was gruesome. You never see them stop and consider their lives. He's a leopard seal. That's just what he does. But we, this is profound. Are you guys all ready for this? We are not leopard seals. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, Deanna's like that. Okay, we're not, we're not leopard seals. There is a giant leap from the animal kingdom, from animals like leopard seals to humanity. We are made in the image and likeness of God. And believe it or not, though you may doubt it with some people that you talk to, this little pound of flesh in between our ears is meant to think. We, we think, we reflect, we are able to do so differently than other animals. So I want to just start this morning with a word of encouragement. You can think. Yes, even in this political climate, when you look around and you hear all of the, the buzzwords and all the emotionalism that goes on, believe it or not, you may doubt it when you watch the news sometimes. You can think. People can think. We have thoughts. We have minds. We are meant to use them. You can, as an image bearer of God, take an idea and go at it from many different angles. Think on it. You can Come at it, you can work at this, you can look at it from this angle, you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes, you can try to be sort of, you know, introspective, or you can try to go outside of yourself and how does this appear from these other angles and come to conclusions, and you can actually share those thoughts with other people. We are able to think. You can even share those conclusions, talk through them with other image bearers around you, and it is great, it is incredible. And this is important because... The gospel message itself comes to us as a message to think about. You know, the, the whole scope of the gospel in the four quadrants, God made everything. All that is is so because God has made it. God created all things. Mankind has fallen. What's wrong with this world is we look around and we see that it's broken and messed up and there's sin and sickness and death and disease. It's because mankind has sinned, has fallen. God created the world. Mankind messed it up. Third quadrant, Jesus has come. God sent his son as a savior to take the sin of the world upon himself so that every one of us hearing that message, believing it, placing our hope in Christ could be forgiven. The last quadrant is response. Everyone who looks to him will be saved. That is a message specifically for thinking creatures. We are made in the image of likeness of God. It is a message to be thought about, to be considered, to be responded to. We can think. Did you know that you're actually biblically commanded to think? First Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It's an imperative telling you, think. You're going to think about something, and he's telling you, here's a list of things you ought to think about. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, Brothers, do not be children in your thinking, be infants in evil, but in your thinking, 
You're going to think. Be mature. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Think, Paul again to Timothy, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. You are commanded to think, to think about God. Matthew chapter 22, a very popular, very I mean, well-known passage. Jesus is having a conversation with the religious leaders of the day. Matthew chapter 22, uh, verse 34 When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked them a question to test him. Verse 36 of chapter 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You know the answer to this question, don't you? You've heard this before? Thank you. Yes, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul And with all your mind, you're commanded to think. And with this mind, you are to love God. The first and greatest commandment, love God, love neighbors. The second is like unto it, right? Love thy neighbor as thyself. But the first commandment that comes to us is that we are to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and yes, all of our mind. Now, thinking about God is not loving God. It is not um, some sort of a textbook that we're going to get out and we just get all the right answers about God. And if you can answer and check off and you know all the things doctrinally about God, that all of a sudden means you love God. No, but thinking is not loving God, but you cannot love him without thinking about him. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, mind, soul, and strength, some versions say. But we are to love God by thinking rightly about him. And so enter then our doctrinal statement that I have out there on the on the on the front uh, table. Is that what it's called? I don't know. What is that thing called? There's probably some official church term for the front table in the narthex. There's a table that has your church doctrinal statement in it. This is a summary of what the Bible teaches. This is not an infallible document. We're not saying this is um, all that there is to know about God. But the Bible is a big book. The Bible is a big book. And to say that you believe the Bible is well and good, but then the question naturally comes, okay, well then what does the Bible teach? And so this is an effort to take what the Bible teaches and condense it into a one-page spread format of what is meant by saying we believe the Bible. You cannot exhaust the knowledge of God. He is infinite. There is always more to learn of Him, and there is more knowledge for you to deepen of Him. So that thus the reason we're going to take these 10 weeks to go through one at a time these statements, to understand, to to invest our energy being obedient to the first commandment, to love God with all of our minds, to think thoughts after God. And there's a few reasons why we ought to be aware of our need to think clearly and definitively about God. The first reason why we need to be intentional about thinking about God The first reason is that our minds are darkened, are hardened against the truth about God. One preacher put it this way, just kind of brought all these passages together for me. He says, in 2 Corinthians 3.14, Paul says that the mind is hardened. In 1 Timothy 6 verse 5, he calls the mind depraved. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, he says men are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. In Romans 1, 21, he says that thinking has become futile and foolish because men by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. He warns against being taken captive by philosophy. You know where that's found? Colossians 2, 8. We just were discussing that passage of being taken taken captive by empty philosophy. And in in 1 Corinthians 1, 21, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It's not through wisdom that man knows God. God in his wisdom decided we don't attain knowledge of him through our own minds. We have, due to the fall, a darkened mind. 
We are depraved. Our natural disposition is darkened when it comes to thinking about God. There is a natural sinful resistance to think right thoughts of God. It isn't our inclination to diagnose God truly. However, when God does regenerate a life, when by the Holy Spirit we are brought to newness of life, the Holy Spirit brings you to life through faith in Jesus Christ, you are brought from darkness to light, post tenebrous lux, out of darkness, light. Where once you had darkness and could not see, now you can see. You are able to see God for who he really is through Christ. Yet, there is an ongoing battle between your old man and your new man, your old way of thinking and the new way of thinking. And it's important to know this reality so that we will not be easily swayed because your mind is not just immediately going to think rightly about God. You have a fallen mind. It's across the globe. We all live with fallen minds. And so we need help and need to invest energy to think rightly about God because it is not what we're naturally going to do. You cannot intuit a right understanding of God. You can look at nature and see Romans 1 talks about this, right? That you can look at nature and you can see certain things about God. You can see that God is God of order. You look how the planets spin around each other and how, how we don't all fly apart. That there's some sense of order. And you also see a diversity. That we're all the same, but we're all kind of different. You can see beauty. Watch the sunset. You can see certain things about God, but you will not come to a ripe, full understanding of God just out of your depraved mind. Thankfully, God has revealed himself. It's important to know we need to think about God because our minds are, by nature, hardened against the truth of God and we still fight that old man. Secondly, though, there is an enemy against right thinking about God. There is a force that doesn't want you to know God truly. And you're fooling yourself if you think that that isn't real. There is an enemy. There is a deceiver. I mean, Satan is called the deceiver. And his whole point is to get you to think wrongly about God. If he can get, or to get you to not think about God at all. An interesting uh, screw tape letters uh, written by C.S. Lewis is talking about the, it's, a, it's demons trying to, to, um, to get this man to not choose Christianity. And basically, if you can just, to get him not concerned about anything, distracted, to just not think, to be uh, caught up in entertainments and just sort of busy with life and never really contemplative, never really thinking about anything, that was a great place for him to be in because it was when he started thinking about things, that's when it got dangerous. You have an enemy. There is an enemy who does not want you to think rightly about God. It's a supernatural and a very real battle. And that's what's mentioned right here at the opening of our passage um, from this week. Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. There is a force, there is an enemy out there, there are philosophies out there that don't want you to think rightly about God. There are philosophies that are at direct war with God. I mean, how often have you heard a statement from someone where you're talking about maybe like an issue of hell or something like that? They'll say, well, I would never worship a God like that. That's not the God that I serve. The God that I serve would never do that. And it comes across as a very pious statement, but that's the wrong question. The question isn't what kind of God would you serve. The question is, who is the God that is there? That's the question we need to be thinking about trying to answer. Not what's the God that I think I'd be okay with, but who is the God that is there and what is he like? That's the question we should be seeking to be answering. Because if the question we only want to answer is, what's a God I can live with? What's a God that I can like? Well, our darkened minds are going to produce who knows what kind of a God. So we need to be conscious about our thinking and intentional about our thinking. One, because our minds are hardened. Secondly, because there's an enemy against right thinking. But thirdly, because right thinking is not the enemy of real loving. My heart for the work here, since, since I've come on four years ago, whatever it's been now, has been to, a desire to increase your joy in Jesus. 
I want you to love Jesus. I want you to love God. I want you to be glad in God. That is what I want for you. I want us to all be supremely satisfied in God. And now some people hear, you want us to be glad in God. Well, then one way to do that is not by a bunch of homework. <laughs> okay, let's not start with this big, long statement about God. Let's just be happy in God. But I think that betrays a misunderstanding. You know, we say, no way, schoolwork has never produced more joy. <laughs> But my goal here is not to make this into some sort of seminary and bore us all with paperwork for no purpose. But we can't then run into the opposite ditch that says love for God is knowing as little about him as possible. That's the other ditch is to say, I just want to love God, which means I don't need to know anything about him. It's just better just to not even know him. I'm just going to love him and not even know him. That's the other ditch. Don't buy into some romantic notion that love for God is ruined by the truth about him. By no means will your love for God be diminished when you learn more of the truth about him. For instance, everyone knows that knowing facts about someone isn't knowing them or even loving them. Like if we just took the facts of your life, any one of your lives, and laid them out in a document, and somebody read it and memorized all the facts about your life, that doesn't mean they love you. That doesn't mean they even really know you. They know facts about you. But on the other side, knowing and loving you without any regard to the facts about you isn't really knowing and loving you either. It's just it's, it's loving some nebulous, some created idea that isn't real. I can't say that I love Darla because I know her, her uh, life history. I mean, you know, we've been around each other for forever. And I can give you all sorts of details and all sorts of facts and all sorts of realities of things she likes, what she doesn't like, what she likes to do. I can give you all sorts of the shows she likes, the books she reads. I'll give you a huge list of all these details about her. But that doesn't mean that I love her or, or you know, really am, in, enjoy her, right? But on the other side... If the romantic notion that, oh, yeah, I love Darla, but I don't know a thing about her. <laughs> I couldn't tell you what she likes to eat. I couldn't tell you what she likes to spend her time on. I have no idea what books she likes to read. I have no idea how she likes to spend her, her free time. Does she like the sunshine or does she like to stay inside? What is, I have no idea. I just love her, but I don't know anything about her. Well, that's ridiculous, right? Can everyone agree that's ridiculous? You can, okay, that's ridiculous. Thank you. That's ridiculous. But we do that with God. We do that. There's, there's a popular wave in our world that says, I just, I just love God and w without any definitions about who that God is. We've been given a mind to think about him. Here's another proof of, I think, of how right thinking does not, is not the enemy of real loving. Uh, I loved my mom and dad as a child growing up. Um, just was thankful, you know, as much as a kid can be for the, the house, you know, and took me to church every Sunday and, you know, kept me fed, kept me clothes and uh, had a, a really nice trombone I got bought for me when I was in high school and very expensive, nice trombone and a uh, car, you know, I mean, just helped me out. And I really, really loved them and, and were grateful for all that they'd done for me. And they, except for like maybe the late teenage 20 years, you know, but we won't talk about that, you know, but I, I had great love for my parents. And then you know what happened? I became a parent. I became an adult. And I realized how much that investment really was. What it meant to say no to things for yourself to buy them for somebody else. And what it meant that now all of a sudden uh, you don't buy name brand Cool Whip, but you buy the Dream Whip so you can save a few dollars so you can buy the silly candy for you. You know, and what sacrifice. And deeper understanding of them didn't lead to me into less love for them, it led to me for more love and appreciation of what they've done for me. You see what I'm saying there? The, the greater understanding, the greater knowing doesn't lead to less love, it leads to more. More gratitude, more joy in, 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 your, in your parents once you understand them, more joy in God as you come to know him better. Deeper knowing leads to deeper enjoyment. That's why I care about things like this. Because I'm convinced that deeper knowing of this God leads to deeper enjoyment. 
We are not anti-emotion, but we are anti-baseless emotion. Not just getting caught up into God just out of some sort of mob mentality. Let's all get together and get hyped up and excited about God. But, but let's get together and go ahead and get excited about God and enjoy God because you really know who He is and what He has done. Don't give into emo emotionalism just for emotion's sake, but dig deep into the truths regarding the infinite God and His gospel. And as you dig those, as you learn those, as you go deeper into them, rejoice in every good and beautiful reality you encounter. I mentioned already going by um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, but Paul writing to Timothy, he says to him, think over what I say. Think over it. It's a command. Paul says to Timothy to think over what he says. Timothy has work to do. Think. Think. You've been given a brain. Yes, it works. You're here. You've been commanded to think. Think on these things. But all of that work, I want you to notice in 2 Timothy 2.7, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. All of that work, all of this work we're going to invest in thinking rightly about God, all of it comes under the knowledge that even as we work out our part, it is God who gives the understanding. No matter how often a person may listen to the statement that Christ died for them, if God doesn't open their understanding, they never really hear it. And so we come determined to think, but also dependent that God would give us ears to hear. I want to do the work of thinking rightly. I want to do the work of trying to think about God and how he's revealed himself in his word. All the while praying, God, give me ears to hear. God, give me eyes to see. Think hard. Dig deep. Learn about the great, this great God and his gospel. And all the while encouraging you with these two pursuits. To think hard, to dig deep, to learn about God. This God that you will never fully uncover. And to pray. Pray that as you work hard to think on him, that God would be pleased to give us all greater understanding of him for the purpose that in knowing him better, our joy would be multiplied. Our thinking, think, his illuminating, giving understanding, our joy and his glory, all tied up in thinking about him, who he is, this great gospel that he has given us, saving us, from our sin. As we head into a time of communion, it is a time to think about the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. At the core of all of this thinking, at the center hub of it all, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every one of us condemned as a sinner, deserving the wrath of God. And instead of receiving that, what does God do? He sends his son takes, lives the righteous life we should have lived, dies the death that we deserve, so that every one of us in this room this morning, for the first time, are renewing that over and over again, can repent of their sins, trust in Christ and his work on the cross, and be saved from the wrath of God, be adopted into his family, never to know anything but days of peace with God. So as we head into a time of communion, I want to encourage you to think Think on these realities and rejoice in all that God is for us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, give us the mind to think on you. As we thank God, give us understanding. We want to know you truly. We want to know you as you desire to be known. And that in the knowing, in that knowing of you, our joy would be multiplied. Work in our hearts now, God, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.